All right, and our final presenter is Jennifer Scott. Jennifer A. Scott is an anthropologist, curator, public historian, and museum expert with over 25 years of exploring connections between arts, history, place, and social justice. In 2022, the National Urban League appointed Jennifer as the founding executive director and chief curator of the Urban Civil Rights Museum, expected to open in Harlem in 2025. UCRM will be New York's first museum dedicated to civil rights and one of the first in the nation to focus on the history of civil rights in the North. The new museum represents a historic opportunity to build a premier cultural and historical institution that will concentrate on the exploration of those narratives specific to the history of the black freedom struggle that expanded dramatically in the aftermath of the great migration of blacks northward in urban environments across America. Please join me in welcoming Jennifer Scott. Thank you, <coughs> excuse me, thank you so much. I'm delighted to be here. Um, let's see, this is working. Oh, great. Um, as if you were here earlier, you heard that Weeksville is near and dear to my heart. I spent many years here um, as in a pivotal, a, during a pivotal time. I want to thank Stephanie Cunningham, I think she left the room, and Museum Hugh for the invitation to be part of the conversation, for welcoming me to the board. I mean, I, as I was coming through museums, I wish I had a Museum Hugh. Their initiative and their network is so important. All the work they're doing and, um, and their potential. So thank you all for being here and for supporting them. So I, um, I am the, currently the executive director of the Urban Civil Rights Museum in Harlem. And uh, I am going to talk a little bit about that. But that doesn't open until 2025. And as I was preparing for this, I realized you know, Weeksville, we're at Weeksville. Weeksville is, is such a beacon for preservation in so many ways. Um, and it's shaped a lot of how I approach preservation and working with communities in general. Um, that it would be. I'm so sorry. Oh, that's okay. I'm just going to change it over so that, you're, uh, that you can see the captions. <laughs> oh, okay. No problem. I'll keep talking. Um, <laughs> um, and so, uh, and it also occurred to me that people might not know what preservation takes because it wasn't necessarily a conventional way of preservation. As someone mentioned earlier, um, it's it's a very white dominated field, very elite. And so this was quite unusual to have a project like Weeksville enter in, you know, as and um, so. Um, my time at Weeksville was uh, officially 2003 to 2013. I resigned after this wonderful, beautiful new building was built. Um, but as uh, I think Elizabeth Kennedy was saying earlier, the landscape architect, it, my relationship went further back to 99 and 2000. I worked with an organization a lot of you may have heard of um, called City Lore on the Lower East Side of Manhattan. It had started a brand new initiative called Place Matters. It was a grassroots survey of all the unsung places in the city, uh, researching them, acknowledging them. And it was sort of a really interesting intersection of preservation meets planning uh, that I also think is an important model. And so part of my job there was researching places and writing historical profiles for them as an anthropologist. And one of the sites that I, I led a central Brooklyn initiative. Um, and one of the sites was Weeksville writing. And so I just sort of got sucked in immediately uh, and, and, didn't, and didn't leave for a long time. <laughs> um, so uh, this, this tenure period was pretty important. It was before it was open to the public. It was before the houses were restored, before this building was built. Nobody really knew about this history. So I thought it was important to talk about like what's really involved with preservation beyond architecture. Architecture is really important. But someone mentioned the story earlier, that's also really important. And it really took a lot. I, I recognize that when I came to Weeksville, I was inheriting a 50-year fight, a real fight to defend and save this history. And so I want to be cognizant of that. As you know, it's, it's a place, um, uh, Executive Director Ray Codrington said earlier, to celebrate and to be inspired by. But it's also a place that documents this history. And it's really important that this was a history that people didn't know very well at all. It was almost completely off the books. Even people who knew about this larger history didn't know the place-based Brooklyn part of that history. 
So I kind of did this inventory. I was trying to, in preparation to pull in what was involved, you know, and I can't, I, I'm not even begin to name all the people involved in, in prever, preserving this history. But I didn't, I'm gonna go through all of these and kind of give examples that Weeksville, how Weeksville was a beacon. Um, it involved, of course, a combination of methodologies, archival ethnography, but also activism. And some of these, again, they're conventional tools, but because black communities and marginalized communities have not been privy, not been privileged to use these tools, it, it's, um, it's very unconventional that they were used by this project. And so it's, it's really radical in many, many ways that I hope has been coming through all morning, but I just wanna accent that. So of course the archival work, um, there was hardly anything published about Weeksville for a long time, and you had so many people pulling together different photographs and primary docs from, uh, from a, a myriad of repositories all over. And they had very little to go on. I mean, basic archival mapping. They had to figure out where these communities even were before they knew that these houses actually existed. Um, a lot of this work was done to landmark the houses. So if you've ever been in a landmarking process, you know the paper <laughs> trail that's required. And also for the National Register for Historic Places to gain local significance, but even harder, we got national significance. All this has gone into Judith Wellman's book, which was published, which is fantastic and exciting, and tons of people were involved in this. It's a story that keeps turning up new information. It's not over, so I'm really grateful for the existing Weeksville staff and, and Ray and all who are continuing this legacy. Um, I'm an anthropologist, and my specialty is ethnography, so I love firsthand anything in terms of studying. It was an incredibly immersive process. What you see here are um, some of the early founders, and they literally went door to door to abandoned properties looking for evidence of this. They had day jobs, too. They did this on their own time. It also included um, flying over the area in a small prop plane to look for architectural evidence. And this is one of the sole reasons why Weeks was, was landmarked in its uniqueness, because it, faced, it looked like it faced an alleyway. It pr this showed that it predated the modern 19th century, modern 20th century, uh, 19th century grid, uh, street grid system. And so, um, uh, Joe, what's his name, Hurley? No, no, no. Now, Joseph Haynes worked for the MTA and did something you could never do since 9-11. He rented a prop uh, plane from Teterboro Airport and flew over not once but several times, often by himself, taking pictures yeah. of the area which we have in the collection. Um, if you've ever done buildings research, architectural research, you know it's tedious. Yeah. And so the other thing I want to emphasize in preservation is it's, there's no shortcuts. It's a commitment and it takes a long time and I know I'm probably preaching to the choir in this room, but you have to stick with it. You can't listen to the naysayers. I, I, for a long time I was working with Weeksville. I didn't even know if I was really employed or a volunteer at times, <laughs> but um, I didn't care. I mean, I believed in it, but I had so many people saying to me, when are you gonna get a real job and stop playing around with those little wooden houses that nobody cares about? But we were all committed to the vision. We thought, you know, we could see it. And we were committed to the accountability of 50 years of the fight for this preservation. I'm calling this activism, even though I actually consider any preservation done in black communities an act of justice and activism. But I wanted to highlight this part, the archeological excavation, which is, as an anthropologist, I know another elite discipline that was not encouraging even now of people of color. And so when they discovered the area, you can imagine this, they don't know much about what's happening in the 1960s. They, they read in the front page that the entire area is gonna go through urban renewal and a demolition. And so there's like telegrams exchanged, this is before the internet, trying to see what they can do. And one of these was they insisted if things were gonna be torn down that they learn as much as they can from evidence in the ground and do an excavation. And as you can see, it's, it was in the 60s. Um, it was like a community um, and activists, people who weren't activists became activists through this project. So preservation, which seems very conventional, became the kind, a very different endeavor. I was so happy to see my, my co-panelists talk about their work in Flatbush and East New York, because it's, I, I hope you're, you're noticing this and documenting this. You're transforming the way preservation is actually being done and has been done. And that's super important to take note of. Um, 
Of course, the archaeological dig, when I came, I learned that there was not one, but there were multiple digs. But one of the ones that's highlighted is one of the original ones. It wasn't done on this site nearby here, across from a school where a lot of school children took place at the dig. You can see how happy they are. Um, these photos are beautiful, watching people dig out objects that mean a lot to them with their own hands and learn. Um, so many people were involved in this excavation. I could talk more about it, but um, a lot of them now talk about how it changed their lives. It caused them to be educators, to make life choices that were really important. Um, but it just shows how the hands-on learning and the process of preservation could be a totally different endeavor than it has been. Um, we worked with, uh, they worked with, I wasn't there at the time, local uh, community college students to uh, catalog. Um, again, collections, not a, not a black dominated field. I can tell you for sure, being in the museum field. Um, they cataloged all the objects. And I want to emphasize this, there was no collection when I came to Weeksville. This became part of the collection, but there was no, but people knew that this could mean something. This was really to try to landmark these sites and learn as much as they could from it. Um, so part of the preservation is building collections. I know there's a huge debate in the museum world right now to, to collect or not to collect. And I have very strong opinions about this, especially when we're talking about erased communities. I think we should have the right um, to do either. Um, but we, oh, there's so much to say about how we built the collection. The, 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 there were pieces of Weeksville past all over the place. We had it at a local high school. Myself and someone else had to go, and literally it was from floor to ceiling stacked with like chairs and these things and other things, and we just spent weeks sorting it out <coughs> and seeing if there was anything meaningful to retain. And there were, um, and part of that is the, the, the stories and the testimony of people, which I think began with people, uh, these are the Boy Scouts sitting ready with the objects that they collected out of the ground, um, getting ready to testify at the Landmarks Commission to say this history before the internet we had flyers like this too. <laughs> um, this is how you got the world. But this is testimony to me. This tells the story. This tells the meaning of the place. Um, and sure enough, there was something called Project Weeksville. Um, this is an example, Henry, Henrietta, uh, Henrietta Lane. She lived um, almost to be 100 years old in Brooklyn and <coughs> donated a, a, a number of things, her wedding dress and these cool beaded bags. and photographs of her family um, to uh, the museum. Um, and she also wrote a seven page essay that I love that this is what I know about Weeksville, all the buildings and the sites. And you know, I consider this an oral history. One of the reasons why we know there was something called Project Weeksville is when we were off site trying to sort out stuff. I wish I had taken a picture of it. There was a, at the bottom, I'm like really ceiling to floor. At the bottom of the stack, there was a smashed shoebox of about 30 cassettes, audio cassettes. And had I looked this way, my colleague probably would have tossed it. And I said, wait a second, wait a second. So we looked, and I recognized some of the names. And I said, I think these are like oral histories from 60s. Sure enough, nobody had looked at these um, since then. And they had started an oral history project when they realized, oh my gosh, we got to save this history. Nobody else cares. Let's talk to the elders in the community. Um, so I took them to a friend who was a sound technician, uh, expert, and in real time he saved as many as he could, um, which were about 20 of them, and we transcribed them and digitized them. And then I launched a brand new oral history project, immediately um, designed it to target four categories of people, uh, the discoverers, the rediscovery, people who founded Weeksville, which is a really important moving story in the 1960s. Uh, people who had resided in these houses. I mean, there, there's generations and generations of stories there, uh, different political times, um, uh, different eras that I think are important. There's so many prominent historic figures that people know about, but they didn't know their connection to this area. So we tracked down descendants and had lovely interviews with, there's so many great stories there that I'd love to share at some point. Um, and um, the biggest category is longtime Brooklyn residents because we wanted to continue to engage people. So um, you can't talk about Weeksville without talking about Joan Maynard. Um, we loved her. She was an illustrator. She was an artist. And someone asked earlier, would she call herself a preservation a preservationist? Absolutely, <laughs> is the answer. 
she knew, she knew the importance, she cared about youth education, she cared about preservation. She became, she was an a, a, a artist and actress who became this preservation leader. And she was inspirational, you never said no to her. Um, I was fortunate to be one of the last people to interview her before she passed away. But fortunately she did see the restoration of the houses and she loved all that, all that we were doing. She's just an amazing person. Um, we did lots of different research uh, investigations in different directions. At Place Matters, I had started looking into jazz history of Brooklyn, and so I continued that in central Brooklyn, and we created something called the Lost Jazz Shrines of Brooklyn from 1920s to 1960s because the landscape of Brooklyn had com been completely devastated in some ways. There wasn't a lot of physical evidence of this history, but it was an extremely vibrant jazz history that, again, an untold, erased story. So there were very few places like Kingston Lounge, major jazz center, uh, 1944 was built, operated for 40 years. So we created this um, uh, oral history project uh, where I hired a, um, Will Willard Jenkins, who's a jazz journalist, to be our lead narrator. We interviewed musicians and presenters and patrons and beautiful stories about how people connect to the times in the neighborhood. All of these are transcribed um, and digitized as well. Um, we did, I learned that there was a burial ground in Weeksville and until the building of um, Eastern Parkway and that they were transferred somewhere. And I kept hearing rumors that they were transferred to another cemetery. The cemetery was called um, Citizens Union Cemetery, also called Mount Pleasant sometimes. And so these are, uh, I call them the sisters, but they're genealogists who connect directly with um, the descendant community of Weeksville, and I worked with them a lot. Um, and so we heard at Cypress Hill Cemetery that there was a section called Mount Pleasant. And so we went there and found out, indeed, this is where a lot of the burials were transferred, and a lot of them had fallen. I took a picture of every single one but a lot of them had fallen underneath. And you could see the area behind was all uh, dotted with um, burials, but a lot of people didn't know that. There's a way to detect it, and so we worked with the steward there to see what we could do. And this is one of my favorite. I started working on this, um, actually when I was at Place Matters, I started to create this relationship with the United Order of the Tents that's based in Bed-Stuy. Uh, and I brought this to Weeksville. I was like determined to like crack this nut. <laughs> So this is the headquarters of the longest running black women's secret society. Started in Norfolk, Virginia in 1867 by two black women who were escaping slavery and two white abolitionist men. This was the headquarters of the Eastern chapter. Um, and uh, a lot of them were, were nurses in the hospitality industry and no one was ever allowed in there. This is in Beth Stuy. And so, you know, I started to cultivate a relationship with them because oh, half of the membership was over 90. <laughs> so the great stories, but also, you know, people were literally dying out. And so after a while, they started to say, you know, yeah, we've been secret for so long, we don't even know what we're secret about. So <laughs> maybe it is time to open up. And, <clears throat> but this is when I really, I want to emphasize relationship building is a really big part of preservation for black communities. It's super important. And so um, eventually we were the first group that they allowed in. We even almost joined the tents <laughs> at one point. Um, and we spent the day with them cooking and having food and they um, interviewed each other and had a great time and we learned so much about their practices and who they were in the history. I mean, talk about untold stories. Um, Jim Hurley is one of the early founders of Weeksville. Um, he I've interviewed him several times. There was rumors that he had all of these slides that um, he never wanted anyone to have. He was, you know, some things you keep close to your heart. And, uh, you know, I was just, I was like, I want to see if that, that exists. So at one point we rented a car. He lives at, upstate in Cooperstown. And we drove up, spent the weekend with him. He was showing us all sorts of stuff in his house. He, he had dedicated his life to Weeksville. And we're like, what about these slides? Where are they? <coughs> He's like, I don't really know. I don't know what they're talking about. But eventually 
it's always the last day, right? He led us into his attic, and we spent, I, w I have pictures of this, we, we were so dusty, we were digging around. We found these boxes of perfectly organized slides, 4,000, wow. that were dated from 19, um, 19, I'm oh, sorry, 19, very short period, 1968 to 72 or something like that. Pictures of this neighborhood, everything that you just don't see anymore. And because of the relationship that we had cultivated with him, we left with those binders. It became part of the collection. It was so, I was so happy to see Zelmina use some of those images. We've, and then, you know, I created a research department and trained archivists and plan um, researchers and we, we put all the metadata and made everything searchable. So, you know, we had, by the time I left, I think we had 130 oral histories. Um, you know, we had added to the collection. We were just constantly looking for ways we could, we could build the collection and continue to preserve the history. And then we, oh, we ref refurnished the houses, restored them, and opened to the public for the first time in 2006. And so I include restoration and recovery as part of preservation. Um, it was supported greatly by Save America Treasure Grant. So Hillary Clinton, who was associated with the organization, was there to cut the ribbon. You could see how well attended it is. This is the first time people are really coming to Weeksville on a regular basis. And it kind of, it's before this building was built, but um, we're really excited about it. I also include programming as the, my co-panel show too, as a part of preservation, because I really do think that, especially in black communities, preservation is living history. It's not about the past. And you're constantly creating the um, legacy. So we did a lot of programming, a lot of green programming, youth programming when I was here. It culminated in Funk God, Jazz Medicine, Black Radical Brooklyn, the public multi-arts, uh, multi-site art um, project we worked on with Creative Time uh, for two years, and it built on so many areas of the research that we had been building for so many years. We connected that with a contemporary artist and then connected them with a community partner in the area to kind of extend this history, and again, to show how living the history is. So we worked with Zenobia Bailey, Simone Lee, Odebenga Jones, I can talk all about this. And we used to always have the opening ceremonies of Dance Africa at Weeksville, so I just love these pictures. I have to include them. It shows that it's like hallowed ground. And then this is an early rendering of this beautiful building that we're in. We were in partner with the architects who were here earlier for many years about vision and, and moving forward and landscaping and plans. <coughs> and so this is, this is much shorter, but this is where I am now. <laughs> Um, if you go to 125th Street, you'll see the building is almost built. Oh, someone's nodding, yay. Um, so the fourth floor will be the museum in 2025. And um, I, 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 I want to talk more about the opportunity available than, you know, because it's not open yet, so I can't really talk about it. Um, it started by the National Urban League, which I think is really interesting because the Urban League itself is a black legacy organization that's 113 years old that was created to help black people move from south to north. But the museum is not about them per se. It includes the organization. Um, they have been working towards equity and justice for over 100 years, and they were born in Harlem. So this is a homecoming. They're returning home, um, and their mission to Achieve equity has always it's almost been like a social services movement, direct services, and in the last 20 years they moved more into advocacy and um, uh, impacting social policy because of new leadership. So this museum, which I think has so much foresight, uh, creating a history museum in Harlem is an extension of their mission, which is really exciting because all the museums are trying to move towards social justice, and here's the social justice organization that wants to support a museum that's traditionally known for um, direct services. So, um, wow, that graphic didn't come out that great there. <laughs> um, so what is it gonna be about? It's, it's a documenting and interpreting the long fight for civil rights and um, justice uh, from 1600s to the present in northern areas. So a lot of the civil rights museum, maybe all of them, are in the south. But we know there's also northern stories. And then it also is, um, um, oh, sorry. 
it's also looking at the Great Migration and the Harlem Renaissance and the products of that movement north. And the idea is to make that information available, but also to dispel any myths, just like uh, Weeksville. So the opportunities, very similar to Weeksville, there's an opportunity to activate power of place. Even though it's a brand new museum in the 21st century, it's returning home. Um, it's also returning home to an area where there's a diminishing black population in an area that's been iconically, historically black, and that people still come from all over the world um, you know, with this in their mind of, of the neighborhood. Um, at the same time, it has its own really rich civil rights um, history and undergoing for many years, as we all know, um, serious gentrification that's displacing people. So, you know, on the one hand, it's more important than ever to preserve and document this history and tell these untold stories before the actual residents are completely diminished, but also to see how we can engage communities in um, that are still there or invite communities back in interesting and innovative ways. Just like Weeksville, there's also tons of opportunities for <coughs> confronting the erasure and invisibility with untold stories. In this case, um, a lot of people think that civil rights started in the 1950s. It's a lot longer history, so we'll be starting very early. Um, people don't think that black presence in the North happened until fairly recent. That's not true either. Um, and, uh, you know, we also benefit from three or four uh, decades of brand new scholarship about, including Weeksville, about black settlements, emergent black settlements. We know so much more. So there's all these great stories to share in a very small space, but, um, and then up to the present day, you know, the classic, what I call the classic civil rights era, but also up to now on Black Lives Matter. And the whole idea of bringing it to the present is, is just like Weeksville, really focusing on participatory history. That's a living history. History is not just about the past. It's about the present and the future. And so the museum is designed as a call to action. So it's interpreting you know, the last 25 years as well, um, which is a challenge, uh, but important because it helps us to know what our options are for going forward to become social change agents. So that's what we're doing, you know, um, from from uh, 1600s to the present. So I'm going to stop there. I'm happy to talk with anyone throughout the day and answer questions. Thank you. Okay. I'd love to invite the speakers up. We have time for just a few questions. We're running a little bit behind, um, but we're going to try to take a few questions for our panelists. Um, so I'll give it a minute. Uh, just to introduce myself, I'm Peter Zuspin. I'm with Bureau of the Architecture and with the AIA's Cultural Facilities Committee. We've helped the museum to um, establish this series of programming. We're a little low on the mic, so if there's one to share and then one I can put around with. Um, so if anybody has a question, I'm happy to start us off, but please raise your hand. same path as you. <laughs> um, I recently reached out to um, an archivist that used to work here at Weeksville um, because during my work with Preserving East New York, I realized that, oh, you know, we're trying to preserve history, but also we have to preserve the history of making, you know, um, preserving our communities. and. For every event, for everything that we do, we always um, document through photographs, through videos, 
and I've tried my best over the years since 2015 to to um, gather and organize these documents, but now it's out of hand. <laughs> and then recently, I just you know started digging into you know are there um, fundings um, that can assist us. And then, do I know anyone within my circle that can help us with organizing something? Because, you know, like as Jennifer Scott said, you know, preservation is is a lifelong journey, is a lifelong work. And you know, I started preserving East New York initially, thinking about we want to preserve buildings and community, but the work is always ongoing. And you know, this year. I was thinking about like, I need to start organizing these files because this is gonna go beyond my generation, my like Penny's uh, group generation at the moment. And we wanna make sure that we have a system in place for like the next generation that's gonna take, a, take over and continue to do the work. So um, just looking at grant funding opportunities where you can, you know, you'll be able to be assisted to create an archive. Um, so this is like in my early stages thought process right now, but this is where I'm at with um, the things that we have on file. But it's always good to document while you're doing the work because sometimes we forget. Um, we're so focused on doing the work that, you know, we don't realize that we are also part of history as well. Um, so yeah, I don't know. Jennifer, what's it? <laughs> I'm, I'm happy to talk more with you, but I was thinking, you know, I've been there so many times and feeling overwhelmed. One of the ways that I start is to assess what's already out there, what's already known. And um, in your case, um, such an interesting history, the corona area. I think Stephen Gregory wrote a really good bit, book on that. But um, the, the Louis Armstrong house was actually created out of an archive at Queens College. So it's, it's uh, they did a lot of research uh, and then realized, hey, maybe the public should know about this. <laughs> yeah. So that's, it's like an interesting case, but that, um, that archive may have something to start with. Um, they, they, there's people who know everything about that archive and, you know, because they were totally focused on the archive before the museum. Um, when I was doing the Jazz History Project, I went to them a lot. They didn't have a lot in Brooklyn but they would have more on Queens and connect, be able to connect to, to their process of creating that archive about building the, um, you know, the, the, the Queens history around jazz. But I'm happy to talk more with you about strategy. Any other questions? Yeah, I just would add something to that. Um, I would map um, the musicians and where they, where they're, Right, so that's one. Of course, taking inventory, I think, is really important, like really understanding like what is there and what you want to preserve. And another um, useful um, organization for us has been the Historic Districts Council. So last year, Little Caribbean was one of the six to celebrate, and now we're working on a larger project. So maybe sort of getting them involved and engaged in, in the work that you're doing. Great, open that. Hi everyone, I'm Naja Aldridge. I'm currently job searching for places that sustain blackness, sustain um, public health measures in that way that give notice to artistry and black dance education. And my question to you is, how do you shift the language for funders to adjust and adapt to your mission? I guess I have the mic, so um, I'll start. For me, um, I think for us, or I should say rather the organization, is we just continued sort of similar to like Museum Who, you know, Penny, Weeksville, we just continue to do our work. Um, and eventually I think, you know, people will um, take notice of that, um, and, but I think you should also be vocal about your work as well. So, you know, whatever medium that is, whether it's social media or through networking or, um, you know, whatever tools you have at your disposal. But for, for us, like, we haven't shifted 
anything about the organization or the way we do things for funders. But eventually, funders do start to take notice, right? We started to get award letters just sort of, it felt like out of the sky, like capital funding, um, which, you know, right now is parked because we weren't prepared, we didn't apply, and it's just like we're getting funds sometimes where we're like, oh, okay. Um, so, um, so we have funding to like buy a building now, right? Um, just, you know, just about enough. Um, and, and we just got another award in, you know, the capital um, piece. So I, I don't think for us, we've never shifted the work. That we, that's just like something that we're not going to do even if we're not funded, right? And we have been defunded, um, you know, for other reasons, but um, which I don't want to talk about. We could talk about it one-on-one -on -one if you want to. But um, yeah, we, we haven't changed anything at all. I, I love that you don't change your work. Um, you know, uh, funding is something that we always struggle with. I feel like um, for black organizations, you know, we already are working hard. And then the funding experience is like you got to work harder to get the funding. So sometimes it's very discouraging um, because there's so many different steps and it takes a lot of energy and resources to even apply. And, you know, we're talking about, let's say, for example, um, my group, we're all volunteer run, volunteer based. We do this work out of passion. We have our nine to fives and our personal lives. And then to, to do, you know, to go after funding that requires so much work, um, reporting, matching, um, you know, it's, it's a lot of work. So it's like sometimes um, I'd rather go, go with um, funders that don't require too much because we're already tired. You know, we we're, we're always have to do so much work to preserve ourselves, preserve our community. So why are funders that are mostly organizations that don't look like us are requiring so much from us when we are already depleted. Um, so I always ask myself, like, you know, are there any funders that are black led, um, that are aligned with our work? You know, I don't want to go after funders that are white led. Um, you know, we're not trying to change um, our narrative to appease to them or to get uh, grant funded. Um, you know, so just, I don't know if there's anything out there, if you know of anything, let us know, but it's like, like I just wanted to share that, that um, the process of getting funded is so difficult for us already, so like going after them is like so much work, that at the end, we don't want to do it, <laughs> you know, so we get grants from the Citizens Committee of New York City, you don't have to be a 501c3, um, it's just a very simple application. You know, you're not gonna get $10,000, unless if you're a small business, but if it's a community-run project, um, you could get up to $3,000. And for right now, that's good for us, but you know, in terms of um, growing um, opportunities, like we have to, you know, grow ourselves, but also um, with the growth comes you know, that extra work that we have to do. So, yeah, it's it's a lot. <laughs> it is a lot. Um, that's such a good question. So, I guess the first thing I would say, and I'm also hearing from my panelists in the subtext, is um, just because a funder doesn't think what you're doing is valuable doesn't mean it's not valuable. So believe in your value and practice articulating that value at all costs, no matter what, because the best things sometimes are the things that you know haven't been done yet and are not funded. It doesn't mean that they're not good. And it, does, it also means that they, they could have room to develop as well. I am a strong, um, I have a strong opinion, very similar to yours, that you know, funders are also evolving and also need to be educated about the world and what and, and you know they're experts in their own right and have a, a I welcome any funders in the audience to to pipe in on this um, and they want to be of help I mean I look forward to the day of unrestricted funding mm -hmm. to me that should be the future especially 
as an act of justice because the requirements are, um, well, you said it so well, I'm not going to repeat it. So, uh, you know, like the Mackenzie Scott model <laughs> of funding, of just unrestricted and let people, people are experts, they know what they want to do, let them do what they want to do and let, give them room for the creative flow and, and also for making mistakes. And, and all that, all that should be included. You should have room to try things out so that we don't keep repeating, you know, some of the same structures. And it takes a lot to disrupt convention and structures and, and very, especially very elite, historically very elite disciplines. I think we'll leave it there in the interest of time, but keep in mind that all the, you know, panels will be here throughout the day, hopefully, so make sure to save your questions. Uh, everyone's very open to talk the whole day. So I'm gonna hand it um, back to, to Sierra. To Sierra. Uh, and another round of applause, please, for our panel. Thank you. It's weird because this is like the first time I'm here, um, but I saw many of you in the beginning. <laughs> and so, hello. Um, I am Sierra Van Richtiger. I'm the Deputy Director of Museum Q, and it is a pleasure to see you all here today. Um, we are a little behind schedule, uh, but we have a very exciting panel coming up with some real rock stars. Um, and I'm actually just very honored to be able to even welcome them to the stage. Um, there comes a certain point in your career where you transition from staring at really important people to then being like, to then being like, I'm introducing these important people. And then the next stage I hear allegedly is that important people know who you are. And you're like, <laughs> certainly not me. Um, I'm sorry, I'm getting hand signals. I'm so sorry. <laughs> Can we make some commotion for Stephanie, our executive director? We are. Okay. Um, so, y'all have been patient. Y'all have been very, very supportive of these panelists so far. Um, and so, we're going to be very kind in return and break early for lunch. Um, well, actually, I'm time for lunch, but we're a little late. Uh, that being said, I do want to point out and just shout out a couple of things. One, I want to thank all of our morning panelists so much again. So another round of applause for those folks. I also want to take a brief moment to shout out some folks who will not shout themselves out. Um, but I want to shout out the Museum Hue board. Um, there are several board members in the room slash around. We have Shari Berman, who is one of our newest board members. Uh, we also have Jennifer Scott, who was just up here as one of our board members. Uh, we have Shana Jeffers as well, who is floating around. She is a member of the Museum Hue board. Um, and feel free to ask those folks anything about their experience. Some of them are new, but if you are interested in learning more about Museum Hue, come see any of us. I also want to shout out Addison Tobias, who has been running around, but she's made this day possible, and we could not have done it without her. So Addison, this is a beautiful, beautiful day. Um, and then last but absolutely not least, I want to thank, actually, sorry, I have two more. <laughs> I want to thank our colleagues, Peter and Karai. Um, Peter and Karai, you want to say something? <laughs> um, on the AIA Cultural Facilities Committee, um, this whole series came together with them and partner, and we did this in partnership with them, and it could never have been what it is today without you. Uh, and then last but absolutely not least, I promise this time for real, um, is the folks from Weeksville. Thank you so much for being, uh, for letting us be in your beautiful, beautiful space. And I know I said that was the last one, but then I was like, oh crap, I forgot. <laughs> um, our photographer, Cal, is also walking around. Hi, uh, thank you. And then I just want to shout out um, the folks in the back with the cameras, uh, the folks uh, from Bowen's team. Uh, Bowen is one of the leads of 
uh, Youth FX as well as Rogue FX, which is a Hue Arts NYS partner. So we actually are utilizing and really leaning into our Hue Arts partners, which has brought this conversation together, but also um, we're showing that they're very multifaceted and you can see them everywhere, including at a Museum Hue program.